I have had the craziest jobs in my life. Um, sometimes people think, well, you're a pastor. You probably never had a job, or maybe you mowed a lawn once. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no, no. <laughs> I've had every type of job you can imagine. I've fallen off roofs, roofing. I was a mall Santa Claus there for a little bit until I got fired from that job on the spot. <laughs> I have worked in psychiatric wards, <laughs> and I'll tell you a little bit more about it, but I come here with a lot of job experience. But I'll tell you what one of the hardest things as a pastor is. That's on Sunday mornings, to, we get into this mindset of worshiping Jesus, loving Jesus. We're on cloud nine. And then comes Monday. And the staff, us pastors, we just got to drag our hands. Oh, it's Monday. We come in. And in a very subtle way, Monday becomes a separate day. And if we're not careful, it's very easy for Monday through Saturday to not have any of what Sunday had. And it's kind of like living a double life, if you will. And if that's possible here in a church, I can't imagine what you poor people deal with. <laughs> when you walk into your place of work on a Monday to hear people cussing people out, to hear people screaming their heads off about how mad everybody is, to have hear rumors of what's going to happen with the company. You know what? My heart goes out. And the church is not interested in each one of our, uh, the people in our congregation. We are not interested in your 10% church time and your 10% giving. I know a lot of us kind of feel that way sometimes, but I'm sorry, that's we might make you feel as <laughs> certain not where we're at. We're really a 100% church, and we care very deeply about what 90% of your life is dedicated to, which is your place of work. So I'm hoping over these next couple of weeks, I hope that what, uh, what Pat Gelsinger shared, which to me was, uh, was fantastic, and I've listened to it. You can go to the website and listen to that a message a couple more times. And then Mother's Day, we kind of touched on it. Today, we're going to touch on it. Next Sunday, we're going to touch a little bit more about it. But what we want to talk about is how do we connect the dots between Sunday and Monday through Saturday? What does, what does my work life look like if I am a person of faith? What difference does it make? Well, let me take you right back to the beginning. In fact, let me take you a little bit beyond Christianity. Let me take you back to where Christianity was birthed. There, was, uh, there were creation stories back in Mesopotamia, and there was a god named Marduk. And Marduk was one of a pantheon of gods, and the myth is that, that Marduk decided that what would be good for us is to create the earth. And so he and a couple other gods, they got down here and created the earth as it is. And very quickly they realized that it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work taking care of the earth and doing so. So what they decided to do then was to create mankind, to take care of the earth. And that's basically what they did. They said, let us create man so that the gods can have ease. <laughs> yeah, basically, you know, we're created so to slave it out while the gods are okay. But it's not just there. If you go into Greek mythology, they've got their funny stories too. You've got Prometheus that stole fire from Zeus. And Zeus gets all upset and all angry, and, and he goes, and instead of confronting Prometheus, he goes to his brother, Epimetheus, and he says, Epimetheus, I have a gift for you, and he gives him a box. It was called Pandora's box, and Epimetheus opened up Pandora's box, and what came out of the box? Every evil you could imagine, diseases, wars, plagues, violence, blood, everything terrible. And guess what one of the items was among the horrible things coming out of Pandora's box? Work. <laughs> Work. <laughs> Work is one of those horrible things coming out. And so often what we find in Scripture is that God has a diametrically opposed view of work that the rest of the world has. Look at us. Look at how we understand work. We go back to the very beginning of the Bible, and what do we find? We find a good God filled with joy, hard at work, <laughs> creating and working and creating all that we know today, all the things that we see and all the things we experience, all the things we feel. And here is God at work, worked so hard for six days. He got to a point where he said, oh, boy, I, this is really good. I need a break. 
<laughs> and it just stays just like that. This is a God. This is a God who created right off the bat a, a beautiful garden, a paradise. And it was God's intention that this paradise would continue and perhaps grow. And everything would just be beautiful and he would have fellowship and, and enjoy the company of, of mankind and men and women and children. That's what God's vision was for the whole thing. And when you are living in paradise, when you are living in paradise, what's life like? Well, God gives you a job. <laughs> he gave Adam and Eve jobs in paradise. So if even in paradise we have to work, we might begin to understand that work is actually a very good thing. <laughs> That work makes a paradise. That work is a part of everything good that we have in our lives. Everything good that we have in our world is a result of our work. And it's given to us by God that God has a special purpose in this work. And how can you exalt work any higher than when God sent his son Jesus to this earth? He did not send him as a trust fund baby. He did not send him as a manager over many or as a king. No, he sent him to the very lowest position of being a carpenter in that age. Today, we kind of hold carpenters a little higher. We have nicer tools. But back then, it wasn't good being a carpenter. And that's where Jesus was growing up around hammers and nails and saws. That was Jesus' life. And so even in that, God has a high view of our work. He has a very special place, a very important intention for the things that we do. Um, I want to share uh, here with you this verse that many of you might know. It's in Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. I'm just going to share just the one verse, but it does fit into a, a, a bigger, beautiful picture if you want to read the, the rest of Matthew 5, including the Sermon on the Mount. But at some point here, verse 16, Jesus turns around and he says, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So right here, Jesus has an expectation about our works, about our good deeds, not just in the selection of our deeds, but that our work would be good and that it would be good in a, in a sense that those around us would notice the good of our work. They would notice a quality to it and they would be in amazement. And then the ultimate result is to by your excellent work to point people to Jesus. But many people say, if I had a job that people were interested in, if I had a job that was more visible, if I didn't have such a mundane, embarrassing job, then maybe I could do something to get God's attention. Oh, no, no. The great reformer Martin Luther in the 1500s, way back, five plus hundred years ago, he said it very well. He said that even the farm girl working in a barn milking a cow she herself is the finger of God. For God takes care of all of us through the work of others. Isn't that beautiful? That there's a, even a simple maid milking a cow, that is the very finger of God. And imagine if that's where God is at work, where God is present. Imagine everywhere else God is at work. You know what? We might not think very highly of the milkmaid, we might think because her paycheck is pretty, pretty small, we might think it's not important until I pour myself Captain Crunch, and then I'm looking around for the milk. <laughs> and it's interesting how we all do something in our lives that creates a wonderful community, that somehow benefits people. There's an end user to no matter where you are on the line where somebody appreciates having this. If they didn't, you wouldn't exist. That's how it goes, unless you work for the DMV. But outside of that, outside of that, every job that we have is given to us by God so that we all work in harmony and in sync for the purpose of God. I know not everybody and very few have the mentality or, and the understanding that our work is to worship God, our work is to exalt and glorify God, our work is to serve others. But regardless, those of us in the church, those of us who follow Jesus, we know that's the purpose of our work. 
we know that there's a reason for it. And every job we can imagine, whether it be in law enforcement, whether it be in medicine, whether it be in retail, whether it be in the service industries, whether it be in technology, regardless of where your line of work is, all of us can glorify God with our work. What does it mean to glorify God? To glorify God means simply to celebrate the essence of God, the goodness of God, the presence of to celebrate who God is and his faithfulness. That's what it means to glorify God. All of us can glorify God. All of us can celebrate the essence of God through our work and in our work, all of us. Um, when I uh, first started being a pastor, right out of seminary, I was invited to plant a church. I mean, start a church in the great state of Maine. And there I went. I'd never been anywhere cold like that. And I started that little church, did my best. And boy, when you start a church, you don't have anybody to start with. And I didn't have anybody. And, you know, I would do my best to invite people, pass around the offering plate. Nobody put anything in. If they don't put anything in, I don't get to go to the grocery store that week. And so I had to go get another job. And so I did. So at nighttime, I had a friend, another pastor who worked at the local hospital that had a mental health ward. And he said, I can get you a nighttime job there working four nights a week. I said, "Woo, get me in there. I'd like that. So I got in. I started working there. And pretty soon I enjoyed the work. And pretty soon they said, you know, we're changing the rules here at this hospital. To work here, you have to become a CNA. So that's going to be the minimum standard of, of education that the people in this hospital need. And so we're going to provide the education for free. And if you want it, you can do that and keep your job. And I, woo, education for free. I wasn't familiar with that concept. That is nice. So the hospital paid for me to become a certified nurse's assistant. Who knew? Who knew that many years later, that would come in very handy? My wife is a registered nurse. And I am a certified assistant <laughs> to my nurse. Isn't that amazing? Every once in a while, she questions my abilities. And I pull out that little certificate. Hey, I am a certified nurse's assistant. Uh, right there, it's very impressive. Who would have thought that? <laughs> but during that process, there's divided up between classwork and then practical work. I loved the classwork. It was very easy. It was fun. I learned a lot of new things about diseases and stuff. But then comes the practical work, and I'd been warned about it. Because the practical work takes place in a nursing home. And basically, all the other CNAs are so excited to see a bunch of new recruits show up. Because that means that today, they don't have to change the adult diapers. And okay, <laughs> that's the way it's going to be. And so I psyched myself up. I thought it was going to be horrible. I thought it was going to be the worst thing I've ever done. But I got there, and I saw my first one, and you know what? I saw a man, and he was more terrified of having me change his diapers than I was to change his. And I saw a man just screaming out for a little bit of dignity. I saw a man just asking, why am I in this condition in my life? Why has God kept me around to be in this place? This is the last place I want to be, and now I got this horrible person here going to do something I'd never want somebody to do. And you know, my heart went out to that man, and I was able to change him and keep his dignity and talk to him and encourage him and, and, and try to relate to him on a personal level. And then after that, I went to another one, I went to another one, I went to another one. And then I went back to my friends, and they would say, oh, I can't believe what you're doing. I said, it's not bad. It's not bad. Maybe the work is bad, but they got latex gloves. You just hold your breath. And, but you know what? Those are people. Those are people. Those are wonderful people who are in a hard place of life. And I was happy to be able to offer service to them because I really appreciated it. I didn't know, fast forward a few decades, that my own mother would be in such a facility. My mother would need somebody changing her. And when I would go visit my mother, Man, I did what anybody would do in my position. I went and found those CNAs, and I would hold them. I'd say, thank you, thank you, thank you, because you guys are so great taking care of my mom. You know, the appreciation that I had for them is completely polar opposite of what their paycheck is. Their paycheck is very small. But I'll tell you, when somebody provides a service and cares for somebody you love, you would pay anything for that. 
to keep the dignity of somebody. And I learned right then and there that no matter who you are, where you are, you can glorify God in your job. So many of us, we just put a, a number on it and, and we kind of tie it to a paycheck. Oh, so the more important people make the most money. And then on down it goes, the least important people. Honestly, are we that dumb? Are we still living in caves? <laughs> Really, is that our basis of understanding of, of humanity, of understanding community? No, not at all. Not at all. It's not that at all. It's about the human being. It's about the janitor trying to clean up the office. It's about the, the driver trying to get everybody somewhere on time. It's about what God is doing in somebody's life, how God is working in a beautiful way. I really um, enjoy this this next verse. And, and Pat Gelsinger, he said this was his life verse. It was Colossians chapter 3, uh, verses, uh, verse 23. And it's, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. I look at that verse and I see this is how you connect the dots. How do I connect the dots on Sunday and on Monday through Saturday? You connect the dots by doing your job very, very, very well. That's one way that you can connect the dots between your Sunday and the rest of your day. Because how we do our jobs, how we do our work is a way to glorify God. It's a direct, you cannot separate the two. You cannot separate the two. A Christian has got to glorify God in their work. And the easiest way to do that is by doing a really good job. I'm going to tell you guys a story that I'm very embarrassed to tell you. I'm very ashamed. I wish I did not have the story to tell you. It's really bad. But when I was in seminary, I worked as a custodian. And they would send me out on different jobs. And one of the places they would send me every Saturday morning was to a truck firm, a uh, delivery and uh, dis distribu small distribution kind of a warehouse. And I, it was my job to clean the cruddiest, ugliest, most miserable offices I'd ever seen. This place had carpet that had to be 50 years old. There were spots, there's no carpet in the floors. Where there was no carpet, it was dirt. The walls were the wrong just paneling. It was no, I don't have anybody working a place like this. It was a terrible place. And what I would do, they would pay me for four hours and I would go through and clean the place in about two hours, maybe two and a half. I would decide to take some trash out. And this is in the days when people smoked in their offices. So it was even gross. And I would clean out their ashtrays and everything like that. And then for the next hour, an hour and a half, what I would do and I had some other guys with me, we would go into the warehouse. Again, I'm grateful that I was in these years before security cameras. And in the warehouse, they had forklifts. And so we would have forklift races and we would play forklift soccer. And it was a great time. All you get, just get your job done. And let's go play, you know, and make teams and obstacle. It was a lot. I learned how to drive a forklift. And, um, but one day when I went through my little area, this little office area that I had to work, it was very strange. It was very ugly, like I said, but architecturally, what a mess. Right in the middle, right, I'm not kidding, you, you could, desk, we're sitting all 360 degrees around this little room that was the size of a small walk-in closet, and that was their bathroom. One bathroom, both male and female. And I thought, ugh, can you imagine everybody, that's all you had to do, it's, that's where you had to go. And I would go in there, and it was, ugh, and I would do the bare minimum, and I'd get out of there before something crawled on me, and um, it was awful. But you know what happened one time? I was going through that bathroom, and somebody had left a piece of paper with a piece of scotch tape on the wall. Dear janitor, that's me. <laughs> Somebody's communicating with me. I, that wasn't a new thing. And what they said was, says, we have to use this bathroom all week. And I know that you would never use a bathroom this dirty. And it's really hard for us here. Our boss doesn't give us a break to go anywhere else. Can you help us have a bathroom that it's not horrible to use? And I don't remember exactly the words, but that was basically the impact of it. They weren't mad at me. They weren't screaming, complaining like I would. They were just saying, we're in a horrible situation here. It's hard. We can't get out of it. 
can you be helpful to us in this? And you know what I did that day? I didn't go play forklift soccer or forklift races. I stayed in that bathroom. And I scrubbed that floor until I was down below any kind of last layer of grit. I washed those walls. I washed that toilet. I got in every crevice you can imagine. I wanted that thing to be spanking new. I want that thing just to be shiny as best it could. I went to that sink and I scrubbed off all that old soap stuff they had on there. I was really proud of my work and I left it. I said, good, they're going to enjoy this bathroom. And I went about my week, and very quickly I forgot about it. And here next Saturday comes, and I'm going through my thing, trying to get everything cleaned up before I go get to play forklift soccer. And, and I go in there, and there's a, a little note with a piece of scotch tape again. But this time the note only had two words, thank you. And I thought, wow, <laughs> you know what? These are real people here. These are people who, if I don't help them, they have to use a miserable bathroom. They're dependent on me to make a difference in their lives. And when I saw that, you know what? I made sure that I did an extra good job in that place. I really put my effort into it. And I was proud of what I did, not because I was cleaning an office, but I was proud of what I did because of the end users. I never saw a single one of those people. But I knew that when they came to work, it would be an easier place to work. Mondays would be a whole lot easier because I made sure everything was clean, 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 clean because I wanted them to be happy. I wanted them to have a place they could use. And you know, that's kind of what this verse is all about, isn't it? That's exactly what this verse is saying. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, as working for the Lord, not for human masters, as working for the Lord, not human masters. How often do I, does my level of work rise to the level of the expectation of my supervisors, of those who I'm working with? And the lower their expectations, the lower down goes my quality. How many times do I do, I've had sales jobs where they give me a quota and I go, oh good, it's not very high. I don't have to work as, high, as hard. I've got friends, that happens all the time to them. I don't understand it. But we get to a point in our lives where we say, you know what, it's not about people. It's not about those in authority. It's not about the expectation. It's about me and God. What glorifies God in my work? How can I glorify God? How can I serve the purpose of God? In what area in, that I'm operating, is there a finger of God at work? How is God using me in the big picture to, to make a, a better world, a better community, a place where things work a little bit easier? Then let me do my job. Let me do my job with excellence. Let me really get in there and really take care of it. I heard about a pilot who asked his pastor, very simple question. He said, pastor, as a pilot, what can I do that would glorify God in my job? Well, the pastor didn't have to think very hard about that. Very simply, land the plane safely. That's it. <laughs> Just land this plane safely and you are doing a good job. Don't all of us feel that way with pilots? <laughs> We would all want that. Yes, you can glorify God by doing your job very well. Just land this place safely. That's what we ask for. That's a very good way of putting at it. And did you know that the degree to which you do your job well will be the degree to which you have more influence to show people and to tell people and point people to who Jesus is? Wasn't that amazing how Pat Gelsinger was just, just as flat out obvious about his Christian faith? Sometimes people would say, yeah, I don't know if I could do that in my place of work. Maybe not, maybe not. But when you're the CEO, some things come a little easier. <laughs> and when you do your job to the very best that you can, you will be given opportunities that you never thought you would have to be people, to tell people, and to glorify God, and to point people to a better life, to point people to an eternity with Jesus. When we do our jobs with excellence, when we do our jobs to the very best that we can, um, I like, a, and I've remembered it for a long time, a, a quote that Martin Luther King used, a very inspirational quote. He said, if you are a street sweeper, some of you know this, if you are a street sweeper, then sweep streets the way Michelangelo painted. Sweep streets the way Beethoven composed music. Sweep streets the way Shakespeare wrote poetry. 
sweep streets in such a way that all the hosts of heaven and earth would have to pause and say, here lived a great street sweeper who did his job well. That's a witness to the world of how we do our jobs. It's a witness to how we show God, God, I love you and I am dedicated to you. It's a way for us to come together to say, look how I can celebrate. Look how I can glorify who God is and how I can take care of others. Well, where does work go wrong? And I close with this. Work goes wrong all the way back to the Tower of Babel. Just after creation was made, and just after Adam and Eve are doing their thing, there in Genesis chapter 11, we have the Tower of Babel. And what happens at the Tower of Babel? A lot of people think of Tower of Babel, oh, that's where everybody came together and then God separated everybody. Yeah, that's kind of it, but let me tell you a little bit deeper. There's a thing that has lasted till today. It's called the curse of Babel. And you and I have the curse of Babel. And this is what happened. All these people came together to build this great tower. But their objective was what? To make a great name for ourselves. And that was the beginning of the end. As soon as they said, it's about us. As soon as somebody on a team says, it's about me. As soon as somebody says, it's about what I can accomplish and what I can do, we enter into competition. That's when the fragmentation start to happen. That's when it becomes exhausting to work. That's when it becomes overbearing to keep working. That's when whether you're successful, whether you're failing because you're not meeting expectations or you're having a hard time keeping the success rolling. Either way, it gets into us when we do it for man. But when we turn that around and we say, it's not for man, I do this for God. I do this because this is how I can glorify God. This is how I can show the world God's goodness and the change that God brings about in my life. The moment you do that, you change who you are serving. You are no longer serving yourself. You are now serving God. And in your service of God, you end up serving mankind. You end up serving the community. You end up serving the the end user, whatever it is that you're doing. It's a wonderful thing when we replace our own motive to glorify and to magnify or to accumulate for us and say, no, it's about God. Sometimes people say, Pastor, I don't know what to do in my place of work. I am so frustrated. I can't stand the place. I can't stand the people I work with. And my answer to them is the same answer I give everybody and everything. It's the same answer that I take for my own advice. Have you given it to God? Have you trusted it with God? Have you put it in God's hands? Because God can do far more than you and I could ever do trust God with it. It's a partnership. Our work is not just us on autopilot. Our work is God working through us. God wants you to do a good job. If he wants you to do a good job, he will work on your behalf to smooth out the rough edges, to to help you level out the mountains or the valleys. God will help you in your place of work far more. It's about just coming to the Lord and saying, Lord, I'm going to put this in your hands. I'm going to trust you. I'm not going to micromanage you. I'm going to let you do job and I'm not going to interfere with what you're going to do. That's a lot of times what work is, is letting God take place. Let God do his thing. God wants you to excel in your place of work. God wants you to excel. God wants you to be a servant. God wants you to have the heart to do that. I want to close very quickly here by just giving us a time of prayer. I'm not going to lead in prayer, but I want to suggest something for you to pray about. Very simply. And let's just Take this moment, the last minute that we have, and when I say the person to pray for, just say a prayer for them, whoever it is that God brings to your mind. And I'll do that a couple of times, and then we'll close, okay? Very well, let's close our eyes. Let's first pray for the person who has authority over us. their prosperity. Pray for their blessing. Pray for their wisdom. Let's pray 
for the worst co-worker we have today. Maybe a real enemy. Let's pray for them. That God would prosper them. That God would bring them joy. That God would heal whatever it is that wounds them. that we would bust through the expectations others have for us. That we would not settle for mediocrity, but we would work in such a way that honors and celebrates the goodness of God and glorifies His name. strength. May we remain in your presence and give us a joy because of the way we're able to glorify you in a variety of creative ways. In the name of Jesus, we all say.